What is good, everyone? This is your host, Deanna Radulescu with Label Free Podcast. To live your best life, you must live label free. As always, bring your credible guests from all over the world. So sit back, relax, and tune in. My next guest, after being diagnosed with Crohn's disease, became addicted for 14 years. He successfully built a real estate appraisal firm for a decade, then found himself being indicted on a federal conspiracy charge to commit mortgage fraud and lost everything. Cannot wait for this conversation. Please welcome Steve Cloward. Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Appreciate you having me. Like, wow. I don't even know where we start. Actually, let's start with the Crohn's disease and um, becoming addi- addicted. So I'm not sure what you became addicted to, but I know Crohn's disease is kind of like a serious thing if you don't know how to manage it. Absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, I, I was born into the Mormon church and I was on a Mormon mission that I didn't want to be on, if I'm being honest. Um, but because of the way I grew up, that's what you're supposed to do. I was whooped over, had a girlfriend, and, uh, you know, she was also uh, raised that, you know, marry somebody if they're not a return missionary and yada, yada. Well, three and a half months in, I had really been having a lot of stomach cramps. And, you know, I this was when I was 19 years of age. I weighed like a buck 53 soaking wet at the time. Yeah. And three and a half months later, I knew something was wrong. I had seen one doctor. He didn't really diagnose anything. Uh, and so I started to reach out to my dad and told him that I needed to come home. And my pride is such that I wouldn't have just quit to come home. And I would have thought he would have known that, but he did the typical thing. It's become a lot more, a lot different. I've left that the church anyway, but um, when he, he actually flew out because one morning I woke up, he basically said that this was early March. And he said, if you wait until the first week of April when they have their general conference, you know, and then decide to come home after that, then I can accept it. Well, okay, what, you think lightning's going to strike me and they're going to say something that just changes everything anyway? Yeah. So I was so damn depressed and so sick and tired of being, you know, because I knew I was going home. And I was also the type that, you know, I had been involved with the church, but I wasn't like real. I didn't ever feel like I had that connection to God, so to speak, or yeah. or he didn't hear my prayers, I guess, is the way I ta- I told myself that story. Um, but I, I, when my dad challenged me and said, you know, that's between you and the Lord, he finally said. Yeah. And so I made it that way. And then the next thing I truly felt, it was what I was supposed to do. Yeah. So he said it accepted, you know, this would be like the, through the 10th of April by the time that weekend passed. And it was like March 23rd, I woke up one morning, like my companion is in shower. And I just, you know, I didn't think anything. I just wanted to sleep till it's time because I knew I was going home. I was so depressed. Walked in the kitchen, took a handful of aspirin and just wanted to be sick. And so didn't tell my companion. We go out riding bikes, tracting, you know. Yeah. We're coming back to the apartment for lunch. My ears are ringing. And so I finally just told him what I did. And long story short, within 24 hours, my dad was out there. Okay. And- when he saw me, I was I was 124 pounds at this time and just wow. three and a half months. And I was basically jaundiced. I was kind of gray. And I mean, as soon as he saw me, I mean, he started to cry. Yeah. And so we come home and three nights later, um, I just had this horrible pain. I was sitting at the dinner table. Just, I think it was just me and my mom. And so she took me over to her a cousin who was our physician, and he said, oh, you've got appendicitis. So I went to the ER, and the surgeon, when he's in there doing an appendectomy, he noticed that 16 inches of my small bowel was black, ulcerated, and perforated. That's when I was diagnosed with Crohn's. They resected it, and that's when I started on opiates. And I was addicted to opiates for 14 years, man, and it was hell. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of people get addicted to that, you know, after some kind of surgery. I mean, it's a very easy thing because, I mean, opiate has got a strain of, I think, of heroin in it, right? It comes from that it's kind basically, of... basically, yes, synthetic heroin, basically. I mean, and the thing is, it, it metabolizes in my brain differently than, than quote, normal brain chemistry, meaning, right. you know, it made me more outgoing. I didn't get tired and fall asleep, yeah. you know, none of that. I, I played with the painkillers for a little bit. I used to yes, you understand it. Like, that was like in my early 20s. And then when I stopped getting the same feeling, then I stopped because it's like, it's not yeah. fun anymore. So for exactly. me, I'm just like, all right, I'm done with this. Um, but I knew people that used to take handfuls of like 
I was taking 30 a day. I could it and be like, oh, yeah, just crazy amounts. So at what point did you get off of the, did you stop becoming an addict? Well, it, like I say, I was, it was a battle. And, you know, this is, I got sober in July of 2000. So you got to realize oh, okay. three years back, you know, it wasn't as mainstream. And so I didn't know what to do, really. You know, I didn't know who to turn to. In fact, there was days I would drive to my office literally just like trying because I just like didn't know what the hell to do. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. And I had an experience that one day I was driving to meet a buddy at the golf course and my my body, like it just went numb from my neck down. And I kind of had this vision. I can't even really, I talked to a guy about it just last week in more depth and thought about it because I really just hadn't thought about it much more than what I'm about to say sure. is I just could see my car with me in it like dead. Yeah. And oh, so wow. I drive to the golf course and of course I'm a wreck when I get there. Yeah. And so my buddy said, Hey, you know, we need to go talk to your doctor or whatever. Cause I, at this point, you know, my brain's like, I'm scared straight now. Yeah. I'm ready to figure out, you know, I don't care who I got to talk to. I got to find a way out of this. So we drove to my gastroenterologist's house who I was, you know, pretty good friends with his son used to work for me and he had a, some function going on. So he called his buddy an internist. And, and at this point, OxyContin was not on, I, as an addict, that wasn't even on, you know, I didn't even hear about it yet. It was yeah. brand um, and cause this would have been in about 96. Okay. Because what happened was his internist said, well, I'm out of town for three days, but I'll work him in when I get back, just prescribe him. I think it was 10 OxyContin and that's some powerful stuff. Yeah. And you know, I think they were only 10 milligrams, but still the point is now an addict's brain who is ready to seek help right. is now being kind of turned back on thinking, Oh, I do need it because of my Crohn's and I had some back issues too. And so, and he, he just believed that, you know, yes, I was self-medicating. He thought it was just depression, but I don't care what, it, what you're addicted to was drugs, alcohol, porn, sex, you name it, food. Yeah. There's an underlying reason. Yeah. And that's the key to figuring out if you want to get sober and change the behavior. Yeah. So, sure. so because of that, I stayed on for another three years till I just said, that's it. And I. One did rapid detox, actually, where they put yeah. you out. Oh, I bet. Oh, my gosh. Can't even imagine. So how's your Crohn's now? You know, what's the craziest thing is I have a podcast called Life After Addiction and Diamond. So when people hear the title, they assume because of my addiction that I went to prison over my addiction drugs, right? Yeah. But I was sober for years, um, and I was so worried about, you know, being in a prison facility because of what if my Crohn's flares up? What if I probably, right. I know, I've heard about how the system is in there and the medical care. And I even got a letter from my gastroenterologist thinking that might keep me out somehow, you know, yeah. was drinking. But, you know, what's crazy is I had two really bad bleeds. It's been about 15 years now. Um, I just cramped really hard. They found out that every time it happened, it was at the scar tissue where they sewed my small valve back together yeah. Um, but I mean, I bled so bad one time and this is, you know, out the wrong end and yeah. that I, by the time I got to the hospital, they got me into a room. The third time it happened, I literally passed out on the toilet. My dad, luckily he was there, but my dad thought I was going to die that night. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> a day later I'm out of the hospital and I haven't had really crone symptoms since knock on wood. So I, yeah, I'm, I've just gone to a mental place where, because it's, you know, they say it's chronic. It's a lifelong situation. Right. But I've just taken myself to a place, at least I hope that, I, you know. I have a girlfriend. Ability that I've just said, it's not going to, I don't have Crohn's anymore. Yeah. Now, do you watch your diet on what you eat? No. When it was flared up, I used to. Yeah. So if it was flared up and I like ate red meat, for example, which I like. Yeah. And I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't go out to a restaurant and do that if it was flared up because I'd be in trouble. So now can you? Oh, yeah, I eat anything. That's amazing. So, yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's crazy amazing. I had a girlfriend. I, I were no longer in touch. She, she kind of, we lives went different directions, but she had Crohn's. And she actually used to get treatment for it. And so she was in remission. And then the last time that I, we had been, like, talking, she she had some episodes where she had to go to the hospital. She was on the toilet and, like you said, passed yeah. out. Just from like throwing up and 
you know, whatever coming out the other end and just not, not a great situation. And I didn't understand like what she meant. It was in remission, but now you're still experiencing these symptoms. And yeah. so she was real careful with her diet. But to me, I was just like, something doesn't make sense here. So I don't know. It, it seems like a very finicky disease. It is. And I don't think they really truly know because, I mean, you've got Crohn's and you've got spastic bowel, irritable bowel. I mean, all these different things. And it's just, it's strange. But, you know, I just think that, I don't know. I just know the power of the mind. At least I believe what I, the power of the mind can do anything. You know? I agree. All right, let's fast forward. So you had a real estate appraisal firm that kind of went the, the wrong way. So what happened with getting being indicted for on, with, on a federal conspiracy charge? Well, I had a yeah, I had a large real estate appraisal firm for almost fifteen years, and had six full time appraisers. I had an office in Southern Utah and St. George that had two full time appraisers. I wasn't personally appraising at all, other than some review work here and there. Yeah, and one day a state investigator came in and handed me. Well, he sat me down, we talked, and he said that he had a, a gag order and that any of the review work we did on other appraisers, that if they requested it, we'd have to give it to them. And I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I don't care. It's a big deal, you know? Yeah. And long story short, a year later, he came in and handed me a 19-count federal indictment. And I didn't understand the seriousness of that. In fact, I had a large real estate project in St. George that's a three-and-a-half-hour drive from where I'm at. And I was leaving an hour later to go check on my project, which I did leave. Yeah. Uh, and the K, the uh, NBC affiliate of Salt Lake City, uh, KSL, called me and asked me if I had a statement. I said, yeah, when the truth comes out, you can call and talk to me. And didn't think much of it. We kept driving, got to St. George, but started to think and realizing, wait a minute, this must be a pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, of course, on the news. And so I turned around, drove back home. And I went to my real estate or my my attorney in Park City who, you know, had always done me right, I felt. And I thought, finally, an attorney that, you know, was not screwing you over. <laughs> not saying they all do, but, you know. The majority of them do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and karma's bit this guy in the ass hard. But he put his arm around me, says, I got your back, Steve. After going through what I did, he should have never taken my case. He's not a criminal defense attorney. Right. And I met with him five times in Park City every time we ended up at the Marriott for eating lunch, you know, and we never, never went over anything. Yeah. And $130,000 later, when I'm ready to go to trial, you know, he's hitting me up for another 100 k And I said, well, actually, there was something that happened first before that happened. And I wanted to fire him, but out of fear, you know, yeah. I I was scared to death, man. I didn't know what to do sure. or what to expect. So I put together this huge file over a week's period of time. In fact, my parents took me and my siblings and our kids on vacation, I sat in the condo and worked on this thing. So I met with him on a Friday, mm -hmm. and when I went to meet with him, and trial's like, four, you know, it's two weeks out, yeah. and he says, um, we need to sit down and write out your police statement. I was like, what are you talking about? Please. Like, I just spent all this time yeah, showing you. I mean, I've got proof of everything. Right. And anyways, I, I said, you need to at least promise me you'll go over this, then we can get on the phone on Monday. Yeah. He called me on Sunday morning and said I was going to meet with him and the feds in Salt Lake City downtown at 6 p.m. Okay. And I was a little weird. I shit my pants, to be honest with you. I was so damn scared. Yeah. And so I didn't know what to do. And I went to my parents. Like I said, I didn't feel like I was the kind of guy. I just didn't feel like I had that connection to God in a way, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I had to know that was the right move to that, you know, right. and I had studied and I knew the statistics like federally, if you go to trial, you know, 96% plea out, the 4% that go to trial, only 1% win. You cannot have a fair defense. I mean, just look at our government. That tells you what you're dealing with. Sure. Yeah. And so, you know, I did, I sat there, I prayed with my parents. I've never, I've never been that humbled and <laughs> broken before, you know? Yeah. And so I knew that was what I had to do, you know, as crazy as that sounds to some people. And it was a tough pill to swallow because I talk about feeling like you're not being true to yourself when you're going to plead guilty to something that you know you didn't do anything intentionally to do anything wrong. You know, I didn't have any gain out of anything. Right. So it was it was brutal and that happened and I spent 14 and a half months in federal prison. Wow. So what was that like? You know, it was, 
it was interesting. I was broken, depressed for about two and a half, three months. Yeah. Um, and the hardest part was as somebody who had a lot of success and felt like no matter what, you know, road bumps life gives you, you you're just a problem solver. Yeah. But all of a sudden I had a problem I couldn't solve or I didn't have anyone that helped me solve. Yeah. And that was the toughest pill to swallow. But then losing everything and being in there, knowing you got a wife and five kids at home just sucking wind. Yeah. That was horrible. But the thing that kind of changed it for me is I received a letter from a friend of my mother's who I didn't meet for like six years after I got home even. Oh, wow. I've been home for 13 years this September. And she just wrote me this letter and she con continued to every month. But this first letter said, you know, Steve, I don't know what it would be like to be there and I'm not going to pretend to know. Yeah. But if you could challenge yourself every night before you go to sleep, think of three things that day, even though you're in there, that you do have to be grateful for. Yeah. And when, man, when you're in gratitude, you cannot be depressed. You can't, you know, it changes everything. And yeah. so it almost chokes me up because that, that did change everything. You know, yeah, it was, it was crazy. But then when I got out, I was broken in different ways, you know, because it was like, and you know, when my dad retired, he, I remember him coming to me and we were talking once and he was like, he was a dentist, very successfully, just like, I don't know who I am anymore. I'm not Dr. Cloward. And I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. But now I wasn't the successful business guy, the appraiser, you know, the guys involved in community and stuff. And I was lost and my confidence was shot. I didn't know what I was going to do. And so that's kind of why I started what I do. A lot of what I do is because I wasted eight years until I figured it out. Even though I knew it, you know, I just kind of sat in, I guess if I'm just being honest, a victim stance, you yeah. know, and I kind of forgot that the success that I achieved didn't happen overnight. No. You know, but because you've been there and you know what it's like and now you can't even take your kids out to dinner. You can't take your kids on spring break or do anything that, you know, everybody else, you know, is doing. Yeah. You know, once you know a certain lifestyle and, I, and I'm not talking, you know, this isn't about money, but we do need money and there's nothing wrong with money. It's just how you choose to use it. Correct. Uh, but if you hadn't been there and hadn't realized those different things, really it's the time freedom, the ability to help others, but also spend time with your family. I mean, what more is there really than family or very close friends, you know, because to me, life's about relationships. That's everything. And that was very tough. And so I just, you know, I was screwed up. And so I waste a lot of money on coaches and consultants, but once I figured out that, hey, man, I've got to rewire my mind. i got to change my thinking, and I've got to just pretend I've never been there. Yeah. And yeah. just just get after it. Yeah. So sure. that's what I did. That's beautiful. So do you ever, like, look back and, and think about, like, maybe what had gone wrong where you got that indictment? Oh, yeah. Um, like I said, it's interesting because the guy that was intentionally doing these double closes is what they were. Oh, okay. You have an, quote, investor that's buying property A. Right. And then there's like a straw buyer buying property B. Okay. You know, or they're actually buying property A, but there's two transactions. So they're sucking out the value. I gotcha. It's inflated to right. use as down. And then it's not a primary residence for whoever that straw buyer is. And it's crazy because I found out um, about a year before I got the indictment, I kind of figured out what was going on. And so, and the guy that was doing this, his dad and mom died in a plane crash in 1979 that my parents were supposed to be on. Oh, They wow. out the night before. Like Holy I said, God. my dad was a dentist. This guy was an orthodontist. January 9th of 79. I remember like it was yesterday. I was in fifth grade and my dad called. So they took their two youngest daughters instead of my parents, mm -hmm. seven and five years old, and they left their three older boys home. And I remember my dad calling the oldest boy and saying, hey, have you heard from, you know, your dad? Yeah. And he's always like, okay, well, just tell him to call Sherman when you hear from him, you know, 
Sure. Because they did done business together as well. And as soon as my dad hung up, man, he took the whole, got our whole family together and he sat us down to pray and he was sobbing like he knew. Oh, and wow. nobody knew. Yeah. They weren't even late really yet. Yeah. You know, and then it took five days till the beeper went off. But anyway, so the youngest son was the guy doing these double closes. And so there's obviously some guilt by association. Sure. You, you got to understand my appraisers were the low appraisals because on jumbo deals, you have to have two and they fund off the lowest. Okay. The two appraisers that were also appraising the same properties were not only coming in between 250 to 400 K higher, they were also invoicing 5,000 per appraisal. Oh, wow. so they're invoicing the standard, you know, thousand dollars for yeah. jumbo on, of that level. And so it was a nightmare because I also thought when this went down that he would, you know, say, Hey, you know, conspire with Steve for any of this stuff, but that was just me being naive, you know? Yeah. So you so, took a bullet for him then? No, every, there was five different people. Cause it, you know, in a conspiracy oh. case like that, you know, he definitely got nailed. The real estate agent, you know, got nailed. Appraiser has to get nailed. Title guy has to get nailed in the lender. Oh, so, wow. yeah, it was crazy. Well, Holy cow. But it was one of those deals that, you know, I, I kind of joked that in my addiction, I did things that would have definitely caused me jail time, probably prison. Sure. You know, because I did. I forged some of my dad's scripts. I never was the one filling them, but I yeah. wrote them. Oh, wow. um, you know, so I should have had some consequence to that. So maybe karma, this was karma's way of How did those you... consequences because, yeah, there wasn't, I didn't intentionally do anything or wasn't, you know, gaining any benefit. I wasn't conspiring with him or the realtor yeah. or any gain. Those two gained big time, you know, because sure. they were making money on the deals, um, but we didn't. And so I didn't really think, like I said, I didn't take it serious. I didn't understand what it meant. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a blessing though in disguise, even though it rocked my world, yeah. you know, and turn my life upside down. Um, you know, when, when you get in prison, it only takes a short, short few days to understand the things that really matter. Yeah. And I was a workaholic. I had six different companies. Everything was about money and stuff. And you realize also that that shit doesn't define you. Yeah. But I thought it did. You know, I was trying to keep up with the Joneses and sure. it's like, that is, it, it took that even though I know that deep down, I've been raised in a way to know those things, but until it's pulled from you the way it was for me, that doesn't mean you're going to really grab it and say, wow, I do get this and that's no way to do life, you know? Yeah, for sure. How was your, how was your family after like you going through that? And then when you came home, man, I'll never forget, uh, all in home, I was there three weeks. When I was the dad. I got four boys to help play baseball. My oldest was a senior in high school. And I was a dad that when I went and bought one $300 bat for the oldest, I had to bring three more home. Yeah. And just dumb things like that, you know. And this kid tells me, Dad, none of that stuff matters. He's 18. He's now the man of the house. Yeah. And holy shit, he's 32 now. He has a, his first daughter, so it's three months old. None of my kids got involved in drugs or drinking or nothing, man. And by the grace of God, I'm still married. 33 years. This We're still in June. Yeah, June 9th. Wow. And thanks. But, and we went through some shit. I mean, major. I mean, I left two years into my marriage, you know, three different times in a two-year span because of what my brain chemistry on drugs was telling me. Oh, wow. And, yeah, it's a miracle that we didn't end up divorced. Yeah, well, your wife is a strong woman then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At least. I think we're going to have to have a part two of this because uh, we need to <laughs> things up. I, th I have a lot more questions for you. Um, right. What an incredible story. I think it is a testament to um, what we can overcome. And you know that yeah. our journey does not define us. It is actually helps us um, go to completely different destinations than we ever thought were possible. Where can people find you, connect with you, and learn more, Steve, and support you? You can find me on any of the social platforms, really. Most of my handles are Steve Cloward. I think on Facebook, Steve Cloward with the number one behind it. You know, my website's uh, Steve at 
or excuse me, it's life after addiction and diet. Actually, best way to, that's a long URL. So I do have <laughs> SteveCloward.com just going to my website. Okay. Um, and that's the best way, really. Perfect. You guys, I'm going to put those links in the show notes. So go connect with him on social media. Go check out his website. Go listen to his podcast. You, these are all great ways to support us. And if there's any, if you want to reach out to him, I'm sure there's an easy way just to go send him a message on Instagram or Facebook and to start a conversation. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Steve, this is the part of the show where I like to ask for last words of wisdom or advice. What would you like to leave with us today? You know, we truly have more power than we understand. And the thing that changed my life with what I went through was creating what I call a conscious self-creation statement. And that was the I am's, the I have's, as far as what my life I wanted it to be like. You know, I have a fantastic marriage, you know. I have this. It can be materialistic. It can be things like that. It can be X amount of income, whatever. Um, but it's all basically just to find the things in all the different areas of your life in that kind of a statement. And I, you know, I memorized it. And they say if you read it, write it, see it, and hear it, you know, that gives it the most power. You know, I was obviously saying it and hearing it yeah. every day. So I got in that habit. And within two years, everything in my life that I'd talked about had manifested itself other than two things. And those have happened since. And so we don't understand the power of our thoughts, I don't think, to the, the level and our words. And I just guarantee people that are listening that, you know, whether you're struggling, whether you want to do some things different, if you'll just believe in it and put it out there and truly believe me, you have to feel there's a difference between just writing it down or having a vision board and then just going on with your day and you know, you have to take kind of that next level, but, you know, cause we're just all just energetic beings. And so whatever we put out, I believe we live in a, a, I guess it's whatever you want to call it, the life of a boomerang, mm -hmm. whatever you put out, you'll get back. So if it's negative, you're going to have more negative. If it's positive. You're going to have more positive. Woo. Yes. On that note, I'm a big believer in manifestation. Totally. We are on the same on the same page there. Steve, thank you so much for sharing a portion of your story. I'm going to want you to come back for part two. Um, but thank you so much for be being, being honest and vulnerable, talking about things that you've gone through, because it's definitely inspiring and empowering for anyone out there that might be going through something similar. Thank you. And appreciate you having me. That, that means a lot. And uh, appreciate what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. You guys, this is your host, Deanna Radulescu with Label Free Podcast. Live your best life. You must live label free. As always, don't forget to subscribe, follow, rate, review, comment, share, all those good things. And I'll be back soon with more dynamic guests.